Hello, U.S. History students, and welcome to Unit 8, Lesson 1, The Beginnings of the Civil Rights Movement. In order to understand why the Civil Rights Movement was so important and continues to be so important, it's very important for us to look back at the history of African Americans within the United States. Beginning that story in 1619, when the first African slaves were brought to the British colonies, and we will go all the way through 1954 in two sections. Just 12 years after the first permanent British settlement at Jamestown, in 1619, the first African slaves were introduced to the British colonies. By 1660, slave labor had replaced indentured servitude. Indentured servitude is where another person will pay your passage to the colonies in exchange for a promise that you will work for them for seven years. At the end of that seven years, you're then freed. Many people started taking advantage of those indentured servants and extending their time frame to where they essentially were indentured to that person for life. And a lot of people stopped taking that option to get to the colonies. And so people had to find another way of making sure that their stuff got done. So they implemented slave labor. And by the mid 17th century, that is the main colonial labor system. And it's very important to understand that this is not only in the Southern colonies. Slaves were in all of the British colonies. In the South, they worked on tobacco and rice plantations, and in the North, they were domestic servants. A domestic servant is essentially a house slave, a person who works in the house. And in the North, it was seen as a status symbol. If you had one or two slaves working in your house, you were high class. You had some prominence in society. And throughout this time period, of the transatlantic slave trade, it's important to understand that not all of those Africans are coming to the British colonies. In fact, a large majority of those people are being sent to Central South America and the Caribbean. Only about 2 million African slaves are brought to what we would know as the British colonies, but that's still a substantial amount of people that were brought here against their will. Before the American Re Revolution, slaves are present in every single one of the 13 colonies. And when the war breaks out in 1776, not a lot ends up changing right away. The attitudes towards slavery do change some, but when the Founding Fathers begin to set up this new governmental experiment that we call the United States, they don't abolish slavery. In fact, many of our founding fathers were slave owners. Two of the most famous and prominent ones, being George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, were also two of the largest slave owners in Virginia. So they choose not to abolish slavery when creating this new nation. And it's not until 1804 that slavery is outlawed in the North. From 1800 to 1860, a lot of sectional tension increases as slavery begins to expand into the West. And this means that the different sections that are coming into the United States now have to determine, are they going to allow slavery in their state or are they going to ban it? This also increases in the South as King Cotton becomes the biggest cash crop. When cotton becomes to be the biggest commodity that we're exporting, we need more slave labor to be able to plant all of that cotton and harvest it and sell it. And so this increases the need for slave labor throughout the South as the South expands. We also see people starting to fight to ban slavery. Abolitionists like William Lloyd Garrison, who very famously wrote an abolitionist newspaper called The Liberator to 
perpetrate his opinion on abolition. Frederick Douglass, who was born a slave and escaped slavery in Maryland, and began giving speeches on his belief of, of abolition and really became a very famous orator or speaker and one of the forefront people in the abolition, mo abolition movement. And then Harriet Beecher Stowe, who very famously wrote a book called Uncle Tom's Cabin to expose the atroci atrocities and the bad things that are happening on those plantations and in slavery to get people to start realizing that it's time to get rid of it. These people and many, many others begin to really try to get people to understand it's time to end this. It's a horrible practice. Not only that, but as the nation expands, when we get Texas and the Mexican Cession territories and things like that, it really comes down to how are we going to let these states into our union? Are we going to allow them to be free states? Are we going to allow them to be slave states? Are we going to give them the option or are we going to tell them what they have to do? This leads to some really bad events. Uh, Bleeding Kansas is one where Kansas was voting on whether they were going to be free or slave, and people from Missouri decided to flee to Kansas and start voting to be a slave state because Missouri was a slave state. This led to a lot of violence, um, which is why we call it Bleeding Kansas. The Dred Scott case, where Dred Scott was a slave, his owner moved from a slave state to a free state, and so Dred Scott petitioned that state's government and said, I'm a slave that now lives in a free state, therefore I should be free. And the court's like, no, you're a slave. You have no rights. Therefore, you will remain a slave. And all of this really leads up to the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860. And this is the man who becomes known as the Great Emancipator, who issues the Emancipation Proclamation, freeing the slaves in the South, which at that point didn't make a whole lot of sense since the South had created its own country and seceded from the United States or separated. So technically the South was its own country and his law didn't apply, but he really sets the stage for what comes after the Civil War. The Civil War is fought between 1861 and 1865, and after 1865 we get an era called Reconstruction. We're reconstructing or putting the nation back together. And this leads to a lot of new rights for African Americans, but it also leads to continuing discrimination and leads to the Jim Crow era, which is what happens after Reconstruction, where African Americans are segregated and they have less rights. So let's look at that. The Union victory in the Civil War leads to three extremely important constitutional amendments as well as the creation of the Freedmen's Bureau, which is an organization that seeks to fight for the rights of those newly freed slaves, and then breaks the nation into five military zones. These five military zones are in the South, where Union military are sent to enforce these new laws. The three amendments that are known as the Reconstruction Amendments are extremely important because the 13th Amendment abolishes slavery in the United States. It's now illegal. It cannot happen anymore. The 14th Amendment grants citizenship to those newly freed slaves. And then the 15th Amendment allows voting rights to the freed men. It's very important to understand women even in this situation, are not allowed to vote, regardless of color. The 15th Amendment is only for African American men. A lot of the people in the South really don't like that. They don't believe that these people should have rights. Many of them still believe that these people aren't even people. So they respond with the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, 
which is a very famous organization that would go around and be hateful to African Americans. And the Black Codes, which were a set of unwritten laws on how society should manage these newly freed people. Reconstruction then ends in 1877. The succeeding years, 1877 through 1954, are an era known as Jim Crow. Jim Crow laws create segregation. They're trying to make it to where white people and black people do not talk to each other. They can't be friends. They can't be around each other. Segregation means that one group of people goes to one side, the other group of people goes to the other. Separate. They also, during this era, create different ways to prevent African Americans from voting. Because most of the time they feel like these people are still inferior. So they're not smart enough to vote. So let's just prevent them from doing that. One of the ways they do this is poll taxes, where in order for you to vote, you would have to pay a tax. Many of these newly freed African Americans are what we call sharecroppers. So they're still working the land that they've worked for years, and they share portions of the profit with the owner of the land. They're not making a lot of money. They really don't have the money to be able to pay a poll tax. We also get literacy tests. You have to prove that you're smart enough to be able to vote. But these literacy tests were rigged. They were impossible to pass. You had a very short amount of time to do a lot of questions. And they really were created specifically to prevent African Americans from voting. And the last one was the grandfather clause. If you had a grandfather who had been able to vote, you then yourself could vote. But many of the slaves during this time, or the freed slaves or their children, didn't have grandfathers who could vote because their grandfathers had been slaves as well. So that prevented them from voting. And the whole purpose was to prevent African Americans from voting. It's in this time period that we see the early civil rights leaders like W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington. And these two men fight against segregation laws and believe that African Americans should have the same rights as white men. While they differ on how to reach that goal, both of them believe in the same end goal. W.E.B. Du Bois is one of the founding members of the NAACP, or the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and this organization was founded to help African Americans to obtain the rights that they were promised. In 1896, we see the first major civil rights Supreme Court case. This is Plessy v. Ferguson. And the background of this case really stems from an 1890 Louisiana law that said that train cars had to be provided separately, one for white people, one for African American people. And this really stems from a socially accepted separation of the races. This law stipulates that all passenger railway railways have to provide these separate cars. However, those cars are supposed to be equal in facilities. So it's supposed to be the same, same car, just only white people can go on one, only black people can go on the other. And in order to challenge this, a man named Homer Plessy agrees to get on the white car. And he was of mixed race. He described himself as seven-eighths Caucasian and one-eighth African-American blood. 
And at this point in time, if you had one drop of African-American blood, if you had one black ancestor, you were black. And so that one eighth African-American blood prevented him from riding in the white car, but he did it anyway. So on June 7th of 1892, Plessy bought a ticket on a train from New Orleans to Covington, Louisiana, and he sits in an open seat on the white only car. After refusing to leave that car at the conductor's insistence, he's arrested and he's thrown in jail. And this situation goes all the way up to the Supreme Court after going through multiple lower courts. And the judge claims that the law violates the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, the amendment that makes people who are born in the United States a citizen of the United States. And so it goes all the way up to the Supreme Court in 1896, and their verdict is that separate but equal facilities is constitutional on interstate railroads. So separate but equal is okay. The problem with this is that these facilities are never equal. The white cars are always cleaner, they're always more well kept, where the African American cars are dirty, they're falling apart, they're not well kept. And this sets a precedence for segregation throughout every other aspect of life. Separate water fountains, separate restrooms, separate schools, separate restaurants, separate movie theaters, separate everything. During World War I, the Great Migration leads a lot of African-American workers to the North because they can get jobs in the war industries. And we see a lot of black soldiers begin to fight in segregated units during the war. In the 1920s, African-Americans experience the Harlem Renaissance, which is a flourishing of their culture that spreads even out of the borough of Harlem and into the rest of the United States. And then in the 1930s, FDR's New Deal really discriminates against black workers, and they don't get the same rights as the white ones. They also don't get the same housing opportunities and things of that nature. So we see this Jim Crow era really start to extend well into the 20th century. A. Philip Randolph, who is very much a civil rights leader, very closely related to W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington, in that he was going to fight for African American rights however he could, goes to FDR and really pressures him to create the Fair Employment Practices Commission, which is going to prevent discrimination in the workplace. During World War II, we see a second Great Migration where African Americans, again, are leaving those sharecropping jobs in the South and breaking away from where the biggest Jim Crow pressures are and moving into the North for war industry jobs. In the 1950s, World War II is over. Our soldiers are coming home. We've got the baby boom. We've got all these new technologies. And white flight to the suburbs really leaves African Americans left in the inner cities to fend for themselves. Both white flight and Jim Crow laws leave the United States as segregated as ever. And now it's really time for a change. This leads us into the modern civil rights movement, which we will discuss in future lessons. This is going to bring us to the end of Unit 8, Lesson 1. And I hope you have a great day.